Sorry. Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm the chief system architect of SiteGround, and uh, I'm also coordinating some stuff here for OpenFest and other events like this. And I'm teaching network security and uh, living system administration courses in Sofia University. So uh, why I'm going to talk about this? Uh, because uh, every year, uh, since we are a hosting company, every year we get a lot of attacks. Not so many as uh, the huge uh, companies like Cloudflare or uh, Akamai or uh, something like this. But for us, uh, every downtime is a downtime that we don't want. So uh, this year was the year when we wanted to fix this issue once and for all. We haven't. But uh, <laughs> I'll share my experience how and what I did to make this uh, a little bit more bearable. Uh, I don't still have the project uh, on GitHub, but if anyone is interested in the code, uh, write to me and I'll share what I have with you directly. Uh, simply because it's not production ready and I don't like uh, my coding mistakes in GitHub. Uh, First, uh, let's look about, uh, let's see what attacks we have. Uh, 4 to 10 gigabits is not a big problem for most of the companies. Uh, you can get 10 gigabits, uh, even in Bulgaria, to your home from some uh, ISPs. So 10 gigabits is not a problem. And these are uh, some of the most frequent ones, usually. But as we see from uh, what I have uh, here on the slides, 10 to 40 gigabits is a lot more frequent for us. Uh, uh, not sorry, uh, is also frequent for us. And then we have 100 plus gigabits, which is <laughs> uh, no, we cannot handle this at all. And uh, most of the ISPs can't handle that also. So. Uh, Let's see the actual numbers. Uh, in 2016, we had 84 uh, DDoS attacks. These numbers here are DDoS attacks that resulted in service degradation or complete service uh, denial uh, to some of our customers. So uh, this is not, uh, they didn't brought down the actual server, they simply uh, managed to clog the uh, <laughs> bandwidth to the server. So. 84 in 2016 and 31 in 2019. Uh, the actual frequency of attacks didn't change so much, but uh, how we handle this uh, changed a lot during the years. And uh, these numbers don't reflect that there, is less, uh, there are less attacks. There are actually more attacks usually, but uh, we handle them better, and this doesn't result in uh, uh, service degradation. So these are most of the time DDoS attacks. If it is a DOS attack, directly from single source to our servers, we don't have problems with that, or at least uh, we rarely have problems with that. So. Uh, Sometimes we don't get attacks at all, but sometimes we get nine or more. Uh, this talk I gave two weeks ago in Linux Peter uh, in St. Petersburg, and uh, at that point we were only to 31 attacks. Now we are at 36 attacks. <laughs> this is the difference of two weeks only. Uh, I didn't know that there would be so many. <laughs> So what's the problem with uh, DOS attacks? Uh, a simple two, you know, 20,000 packets to your name server, which is most probably IC bind, would generate load on your server for up to 30 cores. And these are only 20,000 packets. I can generate that on my phone. And that's not cool. <laughs> uh, and the attack is not uh, huge in bandwidth. I mean, 20,000 packets can be less than uh, a gigabit or a lot less, maybe around 200 megabits for those uh, uh, 20,000 packets. So it's not much. And uh, 30 cores, not everyone has 30 cores on their machines. On my laptop, I have four. On uh, my server at home, I have, uh, I think, eight. 
and uh, on my server in the ISP, I have 24. So I, if I'm running ISC bind, anyone with uh, a laptop and a simple packet generator can bring down that machine, effectively bring down the actual machine, not the bandwidth to it, but uh, it will consume all the CPU. So this is a problem, a huge problem for me. Uh, so, uh, usually, if the problem is uh, with the bandwidth, uh, people buy more bandwidth. So, if your machine is with 1 gigabit uplink, you replace the 1 card with 10 gigabit 1 card, or 40 gigabit 1 card, or 100 gigabit 1 card, and then you buy more bandwidth to reach that machine. Uh, then, uh, if this doesn't help because uh, you cannot configure your machine uh, properly, uh, usually companies buy very, very expensive uh, uh, scrubbing devices. These are uh, in the terms of uh, starting from one million dollars, starting there. And this is for about uh, uh, one, two to four gigabits usually. And after that, uh, <laughs> the numbers are completely <laughs> off the scale. Or you offer to companies that uh, offer uh, DNS uh, cleanup or uh, proxies like uh, Cloudflare or other companies like this that they get your traffic instead of you, and that's it. Uh, you receive only clean traffic, what they have believed to be clean. Sometimes this doesn't work because uh, the attack is uh, directly uh, directed to your application. So what's happening is that this clean traffic is also problematic for you. Uh, what I mean is, uh, I don't remember, was it last year when uh, uh, 30,000 uh, uh, vending machines attacked a campus of uh, uh, a university and all of them requested the main page with the proper handshake and everything, proper SSL connection. So you cannot fight this with a cleaning service. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, Hosted solution, you want to do it yourself. You don't want uh, to move your DNS to somebody else. So uh, the problem is you have to find a data center that is willing to do this for you, or at least help you with that. Because uh, you're not going to spend millions of dollars on scrubbing devices, most probably. Uh, and the data center has to have the incentive to buy these devices for you. So this means that all the clients in the data center should use that service at a certain point. Uh, when the data center buys this for you, uh, you share this device with other companies, obviously, because uh, the data center doesn't dedicate this device only for you. It's too expensive. When you're sharing this device, uh, it's uh, pretty common that uh, when you are attacked, somebody else is also attacked. <laughs> so this device is not directly dedicated for you. So this, for example, 4 or 10 gigabit interface that uh, this device has, uh, it's not entirely for you. <laughs> at, certain, uh, at certain point, uh, even when you're sharing this device, the attack from the other person, maybe it, uh, from the other c uh, customer, may be uh, huge or uh, larger than yours. And what's happening is that they can remove the cleanup service for your IPs simply because they need the bandwidth for the other customer, which is, again, <laughs> problematic for you because you want this service. Uh, then uh, when the attack is larger than the device, for example, attacks that are larger than 10 gigabits usually uh, don't get uh, uh, scrubbed directly to devices, simply because uh, the device cannot handle this. This results directly in no roads. This means no traffic directly to this IP. Uh, and uh, the problem there is if, that, if this doesn't result in no road, you have most of the data centers have uh, this simple network that has top of the rack switch and end of the line switch. So top of the rack combines all the traffic from all the servers in the rack, and then you have one to a few uh, uplinks to a switch that is in the beginning of the row in the data center, the row with the racks. So what's happening is that 
if somebody is attacking one machine in one rack and he's saturating, saturating the uplink on uh, not top of the rack but end of the line, the whole row of uh, uh, racks doesn't have connectivity anymore. Usually this doesn't happen, but what's happening usually is that the top of the line, uh, top of the rack uh, switch gets clogged and all of the machines in the rack are down. So most data centers use uh, 42 to 48 unit racks, which means 40 to 46 machines in that rack that lose connectivity. But if you go to uh, a higher end data center, you may s receive a rack that has 56 units, which means that you would get 54 machines down now, <laughs> simply because one is attacked. And this is interesting because you have to design your network to handle, uh, even if your normal traffic is well below one gigabit per machine, it has to handle more than two to 300 gigabits on the top of the rack and end of the line uh, uh, switch, which is problematic because you have to invest a lot of uh, money for those uh, switches. Then uh, one other thing is, uh, some of the data centers don't have uplinks with one, uh, 100 and plus uh, gigabits, <laughs> which is very strange. But uh, when we were searching for data centers all over the world, uh, there were not so many that uh, you can simply request 100 gigabit optics to somewhere. This doesn't mean that they are the ISP. Me this means that they don't have a connectivity to an internet exchange or something that has these gigabits. <laughs> this is a problem because uh, at certain point uh, a few years back we had an attack that actually de didn't clog top of the rack or end of the line. It clogged the whole data center. <laughs> so uh, at that point that data center had 40 gigabit uplink and the attack was 100 plus. So that uplink was down and when they uh, shut it down the other uplinks, which were uh, free uh, 10 gigabit uplinks, simply got clogged and the whole data center disappeared. <laughs> the whole data center. <laughs> uh, with cloud solutions, you're pointing your DNS directly to this cloud uh, solution. And uh, the problem is not that you're pointing your DNS uh, at uh, the cloud solution, it's actually I would advise you to have your DNS in a cloud solution. <laughs> uh, but the problem is that when you have a lot of domain names, like the hosting companies, uh, it's impossible to manage those via API. Because we are very, for example, we are very effective. And uh, uh, I gave a talk uh, about uh, how we actually crushed uh, Let's Encrypt interfaces uh, with uh, it was DDoS for them. It was uh, actual work for us. We were very effective at calling the API and that uh, blocked their service. We were very effective uh, of uh, editing DNS zones in uh, two or three cloud uh, DNS solutions, so effective that they blocked us. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> DNS on small scale, when you have a few uh, hundred uh, domains, it's not a problem. When you have millions of domains and you often change those, uh, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a big problem. Uh, so hosting companies doesn't have the option to go to a cloud solution for this. Then uh, we decided that uh, we'll build it ourselves. And these are the requirements that I set for uh, what we want to do. But why we decided to go a VM and not a direct uh, hardware? We have data centers uh, in uh, the States, in Europe, in Asia. And the problem is that uh, in different countries, you get different hardware. If we design our solution for uh, a specific hardware, and it's not available uh, in uh, this specific area, we have a big problem. <laughs> We cannot have our device there. We cannot maintain it there because uh, it takes two or three weeks to ship any hardware to that destination. So we decided uh, we'll build it on a VM that can be on whatever hardware we have there. But by whatever, I mean 
devices and hardware that has at least uh, a few 10 gigabit uplinks, which we don't care wh uh, what they are. Then we want to scrub DNS uh, because obviously UDP is a pain. And then we want to script NTP uh, because uh, we run a few NTP servers. And then the TCP traffic, obviously, everything is TCP. We want to do a simple sync cookie in front of our servers, not to do it on the servers themselves, simply because every server has a uh, uh, smaller sync cookie uh, memory space than what we can configure for the VM. And uh, we want to remove all traffic that uh, is directed to services that we don't support. All ports on uh, UDP or uh, TCP that are not supported by us, should, all traffic to them should be dropped on that VM. A wishful thinking was that uh, we should cache <laughs> the, the HTTP responses, but it was too wishful. <laughs> so before I explain what we did and how we did it, uh, let me explain what the network flow is. So this is the basic schema of how network packets go around uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, we'll look only at the uh, right part, right part of it, the forwarding plane, with that, uh, because we don't care about the local processes on a uh, scrubbing device. So this is the right part. You have the network interface where the packet is uh, received. Then you get that packet and it goes through the, let's say, net filter part of the kernel. And uh, after that, it should leave your network device, maybe on the same device or another device. This is very simplified view of what uh, the network is. So uh, this is a little bit more uh, extended version, and I know that you don't uh, read this at all. Uh, this is just to show you how complicated this is right now. And this is the forwarding plane that uh, we'll be focusing on. First, we receive a packet from uh, the network device. Then we can use XDP there, and I'll explain what, uh, what that is. And eBPF, I'll explain that later also. Then, the first time the kernel is allocating memory for your network packet is happening. So, just bear in mind that you, you have the option to stop the packet before the kernel allocates any memory for it, which is nice. And uh, allocating uh, socket buffers, SKBs, is uh, problematic because the structure is big. <laughs> so you're not uh, allocating memory for the, the packet itself. You're allocating a lot of additional memory to describe this packet to the kernel and all of its subsystems. Then uh, you can have uh, in traffic control ingress filtering for uh, this packet, which means TC for everyone that remembers uh, shaping. Then you enter the bridge uh, check. If you have conf uh, if you have a kernel with bridging support, this means that you have this step here. And in the bridging, you have uh, bridging routes, and then you have bridging NAT. This is bridging still, layer two of the packet. Then you have raw processing of the packet on the input in pair routing. Then the first time connection track is involved. At this point when connection track is involved, uh, if you have let's say more than a million connections, uh, most probably your uh, Linux will start to lag or at least start dropping packets. Uh, you can increase that and you can play with it, but in order to make it faster, you actually have to chop some pieces of the Linux kernel to make it work. I have done that, I know that. Sorry, it doesn't work m very good. After that, you have the Mango Pro-Routing, which can be uh, very effective, and uh, we'll see how. Then you have the NAT. Uh, Mango and NAT are part of uh, the IP tables, and net filter part of the kernel. These are different tables for the network traffic. Then you have 
the bridging decision. Now, you need to know should you forward this packet or should you uh, switch it to uh, another interface. If you're uh, forwarding the packet, we're going to the filter forward path uh, first. You can filter whatever you have there, but uh, keep in mind that between uh, Mango operating and forward filter, you have two more steps that your traffic should go to. Then, uh, if you have any questions, just stop me immediately. Don't wait for the end, please. Then you have the not prioriting, uh, uh, the mango forward, the filter forward, the not post routing. At this point, your packet is well into your machine and uh, you cannot get rid of it easily because you have state of this packet that you have to clean up. And uh, after you get not post routing here, uh, you go to egress uh, filtering. This is again traffic control. From there, this packet leaves your machine. If it was uh, through the input, you get uh, a little bit different uh, situation where you also have the added uh, routing decision and uh, additional here, uh, not output, <laughs> filter output and not post routing that's happening to your packet. What we have here are four different parts of the kernel. So the dark blue here is uh, core networking that uh, it's pretty hard to remove. <laughs> then you have uh, the white blue uh, things here, here, that you can tweak or remove by uh, compiling your kernel with different options. And uh, the green ones are only NetFilter. So NF tables, IP tables, stuff like this. Again, you can remove those from the kernel, but without them, usually you don't have firewall, so you don't have any way to, any easy way to uh, drop packets. So, uh, <laughs> a few, uh, 2018, Cloudflare decided that they will be doing this uh, in their infrastructure. Uh, this is when uh, I first read about this. So, they have this article, how to drop 10 million packets. This whole talk is based on their idea with a different dropping mechanism. So they confirmed uh, 10 million packets per second on 10 gigabit interface uh, uh, without a problem. Uh, and uh, I confirmed their, their results at home in my test lab. Then uh, their results are very nice because they show you the differences between where in this slide, in this graph here, you, you drop packets. IP tables can drop at maximum 2 million packets per second. I think you can tweak it a bit. I, I managed to get it to 2.4 million, but that's <laughs> with a lot of tweaking that I shouldn't have done. Uh, then uh, you have... Uh, the problem that when you're using IP tables, usually you're not blocking a single IP. When we are talking about DDoS, usually you're attacked by whole uh, slash 20s or sometimes slash 19s. So this means that uh, you have a lot of IPs to block. <laughs> this means a lot of ranges, a lot of rules, and IP tables is first match, but it means that until it matches, <laughs> it goes through every fucking rule, <laughs> which means that it's very, very slow. Even if you're using IP set, uh, again, you are very small. Even if you tweak your IP set to be on a different CPU and then uh, what you receive the packet, then you have the problem of uh, accessing that packet memory from the different CPU. So yeah, it's slow and it's very hard to achieve better performance there. Then uh, you don't have a solution directly available to the sysadmin with IP tables. Two million packets and that's it. Uh, so this is their graph. So uh, IP tables here, uh, 600,000 uh, packets per second here. And we have this here, 1.8 to 2 million packets per second for IPv4. Directly dropping. Now we'll uh, see this, this here is uh, 
traffic control. This means that the last one here, the best one here, is uh, with uh, traffic control with IP, you know, with the IP command. Then you have XDP here, and we get 10 million packets per second. Okay? The difference is huge, and it's huge simply because you have this. You can either uh, drop here or drop here. These are the two best ones. So you either drop in ingress, and you see the difference between allocating the memory for the packet and actually dropping before allocating that memory. So this is the big issue now. How to drop these packets and be effective and have a user interface that actually works, like the thing IP tables. Uh, so uh, the code for Cloudflare demo is actually on GitHub, so you can download that and test that on your uh, infrastructure. Now the next problem, uh, Okay, before next problem. How I started about uh, XDP, uh, not about the XDP, but the uh, solution I, I built, is uh, I already knew about XDP in 2017 uh, and then in 2018, but uh, it was new and uh, I was not used to that and I decided to be a very big smart ass. Uh, and decide to write an IP tables model and make it more effective at uh, dropping, which was nice until I tested it. <laughs> uh, then uh, I was like, okay, I know eBPF. Uh, you guys know that I made an eBPF workshop here, uh, I think last year or two, uh, three years ago, I don't remember. So. I read about it and I experimented with it uh, since 2016. I implemented the module, uh, the IP tables module in eBPF directly, uh, but it was loaded uh, directly from uh, traffic control, not uh, eBPF in XDP. So this is different place where, again, I'll come back to this. Uh, this is loaded here where this means that I'm adding additional step after the uh, IP, the IP there. This is why uh, it obviously didn't work very well. <laughs> so uh, I was like, okay, obviously what I know until now is not good enough. So I decided to start testing with someone el uh, something else. So DPDK. DPDK is a Data Plane Development Kit, which is very, very nice thing if you have some specific hardware. <laughs> uh, so my experience with DPDK was simply for educational purpose. <laughs> uh, I haven't had anything in production. So I wrote a DPDK program that should drop packets with different uh, sources, destinations, ports, and stuff like this, and started uh, experimenting with that. And I was uh, able to drop at line rate, which means if a packet is received by the card, I can drop it, no matter how large or small it is. Uh, which was nice. The problem is that with DPDK, I had to update a very complex software that uh, is not, uh, well, uh, it's not normal C, <laughs> as I would put it. Uh, then the other problem is that DPDK is nice, but it's working for specific hardware. So you either have to have Intel or SolarFlare uh, NICs in order to have it with its maximum performance, uh, which is problematic because, as I said, not all data centers have the same hardware, so this is a big issue for me. Uh, it doesn't work very well. Uh, and the other thing is that SolarFlare cards, they have uh, CPU, uh, FPGAs on uh, the card itself, where you can upload some small programs. I actually uploaded my filtering code there. I cannot tell you on mic how I did that. <laughs> but uh, with this, the packet is never received by the machine itself. It simply, it simply drops it inside of the NIC itself. So <laughs> I don't know that the packet is, uh, has ever reached that machine. Then uh, the problem was that uh, nobody except me 
was interested in supporting DPDK solution. Everyone from the senior guys were like, uh, yeah, I may have heard about this. That's not good. Uh, then uh, I didn't even propose uh, the solution directly. Then uh, we had, I had to write a module that makes this trivial. And after a month, I simply decided to drop it. Uh, with the hardware issue also. Then uh, Brian Krosnov, you know this guy, uh, <laughs> he said, oh, you're writing DPDK, have you, have you tried P4? And I was like, what? What's that? It's a programming language, another specific programming language. Uh, I wrote a simple, uh, it was simpler for DPDK to generate the DPDK program, but uh, again, first, you had to write uh, uh, in a new language only for this specific thing that we are updating maybe once a year. <laughs> so nobody would remember the language itself the next year when we need to update it. And uh, I don't think anyone would be agree that uh, to learn this only for uh, this language only for this specific reason. So then we go to the XDP, finally. Obviously the fastest thing, but uh, not very simple, again. Uh, it's the fastest thing simply because it's closest to the uh, NIC itself. The, faster, uh, the only faster thing would be to drop the packet inside the NIC. Solar flare, or, uh, there are a few other uh, options there. Then um, the drivers had to be changed for XDP to work on different uh, hardware. But it's Im very important that they made one specific driver to work, and that was Virtaionet, which is used for the virtual machines. So if I have this, I'm fine. I can uh, write code that would be portable between machines without a problem. Uh, then uh, we are uh, sorry. XDP stands for uh, extend, uh, Express Data Path, and by Express, uh, Jasper means that uh, this is the first time you touch the memory of that packet. This is the first time when you are touching that, and this is why it's express. So uh, you write BPF programs. There are small programs, which is problematic because you, you cannot have very big uh, logic there. You have to design a program that would run in a constant time and have a very small logic to drop your packets. Updating that is interesting also. So uh, I started working on this. Uh, I wrote uh, something similar to the Cloudflare code. Uh, so instead of uh, dropping a single prefix, I decided to use uh, directly uh, arrays for uh, eBPF. And these arrays are updated from user space, which means that I'm updating now the domains that we are hosting in the memory uh, without rewarding modules, without, uh, uh, having, without having to think for the uh, slow path that uh, this data has to go through, because the kernel will do this for me. And then uh, I dropped UDP packets directly I don't remember the number exactly when uh, I tested this, but it was uh, a lot more than 2 million packets. Then uh, I wrote a simple user space tool to update the array in the kernel, which was something like the IP tables command, but only for a specific domain. So I could add domain or remove domain. And the other thing was get statistics for how many packets were dropped for a specific domain. Why am I talking about domains? Because uh, I focused on the DNS part in the beginning, and uh, instead of, uh, there are other solutions out there that uh, they cache the result from uh, the DNS server, and this way they don't uh, forward any packets to the DNS server when uh, it is with the same question in the packet. The problem is that I was playing stupid and created an attack that is pretty simple. You simply generate random domains, random host names, and you uh, 
push all that request to the server, which uh, is not handled by this type of protections because the DNS server receives all the new requests. Then uh, for my implementation, what I, you know, what I did was I have a list with all domains that are hosted behind this uh, VM and only packets that are with questions for these uh, host names, these domains, these are going to the server. I can cache that, but I didn't implement it caching there. Then um, the idea is that you get data from any, uh, every packet. This data is uh, directly extracted. Think of it as layer, layer 7 filtering, directly extracted and compared with each entry in the RA for uh, the domains. Uh, this was uh, very successful. Uh, I'm happy that I was actually thinking of pushing this to production just to test it. But uh, I decided to make it a little bit more complete before we test it with, uh, with a real, you know, real traffic. Uh, it's nice uh, to limit the UDP and uh, DNS, but uh, then you need TCP scrubber also. And when I started with the TCP scrubber, uh, I hit a few roadblocks. <laughs> uh, so first, I wanted to block everything, every port that is uh, not allowed on our infrastructure. This is OK. Then uh, if the port is allowed, I wanted to, do, um, to send a SYN cookie to the uh, sender, which is also OK. But then you have to have a SYN cookie uh, for each connection, uh, connection, and you have to verify that you actually have a connection there. And having a connection pool in eBPF was not trivial. So uh, this is when I stopped uh, working on this. But the problematic part with TCP is not uh, the connection pool. If you want to have more than 10 gigabits uh, scrubbed, you would want to have multiple VMs. You put the multiple VMs on different physical machines, and now you have multiple 10 gigabits uh, interfaces. You combine those with uh, ECMP, equal cost multipath, and you get, for example, 100 or 200 gigabits, depending on the number of VMs that uh, you have uh, used, which is nice, but you need to share all the information about uh, SYN data uh, across the machines. <laughs> so you're either using uh, a basic hash function to, uh, pour, uh, to push all the traffic of the equal cost multipath to s every machine from, for example, from source IP to s uh, destination IP to go to a single machine, or you have to have a way to synchronize all the VMs. <laughs> and Synchronizing those uh, when you have more than one is a problem. <laughs> uh, and it's a huge problem when uh, there are time delays. <laughs> uh, it's nice that TCP at least have long uh, timers, and it's not a big problem for, uh, for it to wait. But you don't want your clients to wait. <laughs> so uh, this is when I really stopped, and uh, I'm rethinking this again. Uh, yeah, this is about the scrubber and uh, testing this. <laughs> I'm teaching network security, and uh, for at least 14 years that we are teaching this course, I'm using the same SYN folder and the same UDP folder that uh, I wrote <laughs> those years ago, which is not very nice, <laughs> simply because it can generate up to 20,000 packets per second maximum. It, and it's stupid, uh, it doesn't work well. When you want to test millions of packets, then you remember, oh, the kernel have a packet generator. Nice. The kernel's packet generator directly from the Linux kernel from mainline doesn't generate enough. <laughs> so uh, at Linux Boombers this year, I met with uh, Jasper again, and he told me, oh, you know, I have this uh, uh, patched version of the package gen that uh, you can use to generate millions of packets. He said that uh, 10 millions is not a problem, and I was like, yes, nice. 
Okay, uh, I tested that, but uh, this package gen generates only uh, UDP. So, a little bit of tweaking, now it generates TCP. I could now test with 10 million post packets, and this was, uh, I think, uh, four weeks ago, and I didn't have enough time <laughs> to test it. <laughs> so I don't have the numbers, uh, but uh, with the store pool guys, uh, we will be doing uh, the test on their infrastructure because my switches are max 10 gigabits <laughs> at home. Uh, yeah, I explained how to get from 10 gigabits to 200 gigabits. And uh, this talk has a lot of information in it, so I added <laughs> all the links that are relative to this uh, talk. So I need questions. Why would you need, uh, thank you for the talk. Why would you need to generate uh, so many packets only from one single instance? Why don't parallelize this? Because I have only two computers at home. <coughs> Sorry. But you, you can, oh, okay. I have two physical machines at home and one switch at home. This is my test lab. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of machines uh, over the internet, but the internet is not directly connected to home. And I'll explain this uh, in a little bit different way. We had to test similar solution uh, in Google Cloud infrastructure. And when I asked politely all the data centers that we have, uh, can we uh, have sustained uh, 10 gigabit traffic from our infrastructure to Google uh, for maybe a day? Uh, and they said, no, we don't have this kind of link to Google infrastructure, which means direct internet traffic, and they forbid it. Then it so happened that me and Vasil have an ISP, <laughs> and we have 10 gigabits uh, uh, to an internet exchange that has a peer Google. <laughs> but still, I had only two machines at home and one in the ISP, so three machines, not enough for uh, generating uh, large amounts of uh, traffic. So yeah, if you don't have huge number of machines, you need to generate as much as possible on a single machine. <laughs> Since you're using virtual machines, how do you measure the latency and the overhead that um, are, are employed when you uh, inject the packets from the, from the bare metal driver from, of the virtual interface then to the virtual machine itself? Do you have any overhead on that? And do you have like additional latency? And does it inject it into the kernel memory before it reaches the, the interface of the virtual driver? I have only one answer for this. SR, IOV. <laughs> that, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, what's the hypervisor? You just tape the hypervisor. Yeah. All right. That's it. <laughs> the, the, when it reaches the uh, VM itself, you don't uh, allocate the memory for it. You simply check what you already have in memory. It's not copied anywhere. You check that against the array of the eBPF program. And that's it. So. SRIOV solves your uh, problem, and you can get server cards with SRIOV from everyone now, I think. Other questions? There. Atanas, you don't have a question for me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this kind of problem seems to be uh, very highly affected by the amount of cache in the processor itself. Yes. Have you noticed differences? Oh, yeah. So uh, there's the difference. But in order to make uh, a lot of, uh, to be able to test a lot of packets, you have to bind the SRIOV, so the virtual queue of the card, to one CPU. Just this one CPU. The problem is that before that, you need to clean up everything from that CPU. You need the kernel to not schedule anything on it, which is very important because scheduling only one task on this CPU blows the cache away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is a problem that uh, I had to tweak there. Uh, there's a lot of tweaking on uh, where you receive the packet, where you bind your BPF program to work on, and all of these CPUs, they have to be dedicated for the work that uh, you're doing. 
the problem that I had was uh, when updating the uh, eBPF array, it had to be updated for all CPUs, <laughs> which is a problem. So uh, a solution that I devised uh, for this was I would bind different eBPF programs uh, with different parts of the array to different CPUs, to see different, different, different cores. And I had a very small, stupid hash that, depending on the first, was it four or six characters of the uh, host name, I don't remember, uh, checks the request again uh, against uh, one and not all of uh, these arrays. So this was a lot faster when you have, uh, I tested it initially with 2,000 domains, now I'm sure that it would work with 200,000 domains this way. Not everything is kept in the cache, obviously. So uh, when you hit something that was not in the cache, there is a delay. You, you cannot do anything about this. You have to pull the data from the memory and uh, into the cache. You can optimize your storage in the array uh, a bit, not so much. Uh, you can sort the data in a way that your first match would be every time closer uh, to the top of the array instead of the bottom. But uh, there's not much that you can do after that. So having isolating the cores that are going to be used for this is very important. And then uh, pinning the programs on different CPUs is also very important. Thank you. I was thinking about the new processors of AMD, which have huge level to cache which is shared between all the cores. Maybe uh, you could try this. The problem is how eBPF actually works with the data. You either have per core uh, array or uh, array that is uh, responsible for all, uh, uh, you have to walk all the CPUs in order to search on it. So it's a problem that you don't want to have because walking more than one core uh, is walking a resource that may have being used for something else. So, working? I have one more question. Uh, yeah. Since you, uh, since you men, uh, mentioned clustering the, the VMs, yeah. uh, do you mean clustering them on the same data center? Or uh, would you rather perf prefer that they are clustered around like different availability zones or different uh, data centers? So, uh, I was thinking uh, single data center. Uh, simply because uh, equal cost multipath across any kind of infrastructure that you don't know is a problem, Dangerous. and you know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you cannot do that reliably. Uh, you, you don't know how this packet will reach you at all. So this is the last question. We've got to cut it short. You have folks uh, about uh, dropping. What about detection? I mean, beside the uh, TCP sync cookies, what well, you're using to detect that some file <laughs> is the DOS and other is not? Uh, so this is uh, pretty much statistics. Uh, I was thinking, OK, I'll build n uh, neural networks for this, analyze this with any kind of AI and stuff like this. Then uh, I actually got for a year of uh, uh, DDoS attacks uh, 2,000 packets from each DDoS attack that we had for a year, and then uh, analyzed that and saw that uh, they are playing stupid. So uh, they were with broken TCP packets. They were with uh, uh, broken data in the UDP. They were with broken checksums. Uh, they were broken. <laughs> so most of the packets that were from the uh, DDoS attacks that we receive, uh, they can be easily detected with maybe 20 to 30 lines of code. <laughs> and I don't think we need anything more for now. When uh, the attacks become more elaborate, uh, what I was thinking was, uh, you know, port mirroring and constantly analyzing the traffic with a tool that uh, can decide with uh, different logic, can decide which is bad traffic and which is uh, nice traffic. Something what uh, is done in uh, the internet exchanges right now, but uh, on a smaller scale because obviously 100 gigabits is a problem. I think only the Russians and the Chinese have the 100 wire speed layer seven uh, analyze. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.